On the morning of June 11, 1955, a crowd of nearly 300,000 spectators flocked to Le Mans to watch quite literally one of the most anticipated races of all time. A titanic battle of three great manufacturers was on the horizon, and everyone knew it. Mercedes had recently unveiled the 300 SLR, which was predicted to be very quick, not to mention Mercedes' lead car pairing of Juan Manuel Fangio and Sterling Moss. Ferrari, they were the reigning Le Mans champions, and had future F1 champion Mike Hawthorne co-piloting one of their five entries. Jaguar were the 1953 Le Mans champions, and were desperate to reclaim their place on the top step of the podium. However, an awful, terrible tragedy occurred only three hours into the event, resulting in the deaths of a driver and an astounding 83 spectators. The 1955 Le Mans disaster will forever be known as one of the greatest tragedies in motorsports history and one of the worst sporting disasters in human history. Le Mans was the fourth race of a six-race season for the World Sports Car Championship. The opening three races of the season had been won by three different manufacturers. Ferrari won the opening round in the 100 kilometers of Buenos Aires, followed by Jaguar winning the 12 hours of Sebring, and then Mercedes winning the Mille Miglia. The Mille Miglia was an interesting race as it was held almost like a rally event. Cars raced against time on curvy public roads in rural areas of Italy. The main racing storyline coming out of the Mille Miglia was that of the Mercedes new car, the SLR 300. There were many technical parts of the car that made it one of the greatest racing cars of its time, but there was a small issue. The team was not confident in their inboard drum brakes to stand up to the tough braking demands of Le Mans. To compensate, a hand-operated air brake was added to the rear deck for high-speed braking. For Le Mans, the German team had a star-studded lineup. Before Sterling Moss was a 15-time winner in Formula 1, he had great success in sports cars. He was the man behind the wheel of the Mercedes and was accompanied by five-time F1 champion Juan Manuel Fangio. In another entry, Mercedes had the duo of 1952 Le Mans winner Carl Kling and Mercedes F1 driver Andre Simon. 87 cars were on the entry list for Le Mans, but only 70 showed up for practice to qualify for only 60 spots. 15 factory teams entered the race. Ferrari set the pace in practice, with Fangio and Kling in the second and third spots. Mike Hawthorne for Jaguar finished practice fourth. So the start of the race went as predicted. Castellotti in the Ferrari was out front, followed by Hawthorne in the Jaguar and Fangio's Mercedes. By lap 4, the top 8 places were filled by the three manufacturers. Castellotti led for the first 70 minutes until a small braking issue led the Jaguar and Mercedes through. The pair left Castellotti in the dust and they fought back and forth for many laps, exchanging the lap record. On lap 28, Hawthorne set the 10th new lap record of the race, a full 7 seconds quicker than the Ferrari's practice time of 4 minutes and 14 seconds. That brings us to the first pit stop where tragedy would occur. During Mike Hawthorne and Fangio's intense battle out front, Hawthorne was signaled to pit at the end of lap 35. Early on lap 35, Hawthorne lapped Pierre Levey in a Mercedes. Just before pit entry, Hawthorne overtook Lance Macklin to put two lapped cars between himself and Fangio. Hawthorne veered across the track towards the pits and broke sharply in front of Lance Macklin. Macklin reacted and slammed on his brakes and cut left back across the track. Unfortunately, this sent him straight into the path of Pierre Levey, who was running just behind. The Frenchman had no time to react to Macklin's car coming across the track and hit the left rear of Macklin's car. Pierre's right front wheel rode up the back of Macklin's car and launched him into the air at 150 miles per hour. So the pair collided on a kink in the track, so Pierre's car was on a direct path to the grandstands. The car initially landed on a dirt embankment off the track, bounced and then slammed into a concrete stairwell and disintegrated. The sheer momentum of the engine block, radiator, and front suspension kept the parts hurling through the crowd for over 300 feet. The hood of the car flew through the air and was described as a guillotine because it was responsible for decapitating many spectators. 83 were killed and more than 120 were severely injured. 
At this time, Lavey's car burst into intense flames and burned for several hours. So, before we move on to more of the aftermath, let's break down how this wreck occurred a little bit more. At the time, there was no designed slow lane for cars coming onto pit road, and there was no modern technology where the team of the driver behind could be warned about a car potentially pitting. The only way a driver could tell if a driver ahead was going to pit was if they chose to wave their hand as a signal. Another reason why this was a recipe for disaster was the slight right kink in the track directly before the main straight. Hawthorne broke right after the kink, so drivers behind had much less visibility due to the walls of the corner. The last thing LeVay was expecting of the leader of the race was to be slowing ahead of him, so it was truly just bad timing. Although LeVay had no time to evade, he raised his hand to warn Fangio behind him of the inevitable crash. Fangio claimed that after he saw LeVay's hand, he shut his eyes and squeezed through the melee unscathed. In a way, it is comforting that Pierre's last act was warning Fangio and possibly saving his life. Unfortunately for Pierre, he was thrown out of his car and landed on the pavement, killing him instantly. LeVay's wife Denise was standing with his co-driver John Fitch on the pit wall when the accident happened, as Fitch was suited up and ready to take over for LeVay. At this point, it's worth noting that there were no expectations for the race to continue. Quite frankly, it was on none of the spectators, teams, or drivers' minds. However, to everyone's shock, race director Charles Ferru announced the race would continue on. Charles cited several explanations as to why he kept the race running. First of all, he claimed that if the huge crowd of spectators all tried to leave, this would have caused heavy traffic and would have prevented medical vehicles from treating the injured. Secondly, he said teams could have sued the race organizers for a lot of money. Thirdly, he claimed, The rough law of sport indicates that the race shall go on. Finally, Charles just said that he in fact did not have power to stop the race. Regardless of the excuses, it really boils down to money. The organizers must have known the titanic scrutiny they would be under after such a horrific incident, and wanted to minimize the damage in their pockets as much as possible. Anyways, back to John Fitch. Fitch wanted to reassure his family that he was not in the car at the time of the crash and that he was okay, so he went to the track's media center to use a phone. This is where John really got perspective of how significant of an accident this was. He overheard a reporter saying that there were already 48 deaths confirmed. When Fitch heard this, he returned to his Mercedes crew and urged the team to withdraw from the race. The team manager agreed with Fitch, so he organized an emergency meeting and vote of the Mercedes-Benz company directors. Just before midnight, the Mercedes team was given the order to pull out of the race. The team strategically waited until 1.45 a.m. to pull out their cars, when many spectators were gone or asleep. Mercedes was running first and third when the decision was made. Hawthorne went on to win the race, and was seen smiling and cheering on the podium. A French magazine published a picture of Hawthorne smiling and drinking champagne after the win, with the sarcastic caption, To your health. Cheers, Mr. Hawthorne. This brings up our next topic of who was to blame for the incident. For years to follow, Hawthorne was the easy target to assess blame to. After reports of him admitting fault on the pit lane came out, Hawthorne denied adamantly it was not his fault. He denied any responsibility of the crash until he died in 1959 after winning the 1958 F1 World Championship. Ironically, Hawthorne was driving a Jaguar and was looking to pass a Mercedes-Benz whenever he struck a Ballard on the road, lost control of his vehicle, and passed. Officially, no drivers were put at fault for the incident, but it was actually the track's fault. The course was built in 1923 when cars only reached a top speed of 60 miles per hour, while cars in the 1955 weekend were surpassing 170 miles per hour, almost three times that of the speed in 1923. There had been some minor adjustments to the course in that 30 year span, but not nearly enough to be safe at the high speeds. As a result of the crash, several countries put bans on all motorsports until safety was improved. France, Spain, Germany, Switzerland, and others had an immediate ban, while other countries reconstructed their sanctioning bodies. 
In the United States, the AAA dissolved and turned over its officiating and regulating to USAC. Most countries lifted their ban within a year due to safety improvements, but Switzerland did not lift its ban until May of 2022. Although electric car series had been able to race in Switzerland since 2015, that was still nearly 60 years with no motorsports in the entire country. Many drivers like Phil Walters retired from racing altogether, with many others vowing to never take part in racing at Le Mans again. John Fitch and Lance Macklin retired from racing at the end of the 1955 season. Most pressingly, after winning 10 of 13 Formula races between 1954 and 1955, Mercedes left racing altogether until 1987. Anyways guys, that's it for this video. I hope you did enjoy it. If you did, make sure you leave a like and subscribe. I know this was a little bit different, but I hope you guys thought it was interesting and you learned something about the incident. So if you did, let me know down in the comments down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.